on a fishing boat off of the coast of Half Moon Bay, at a fourth generation produce farm north of San Diego, at the Oregon home of America's oldest tofu shop, and at a James Beard nominated restaurant founded by a former CIA operative, we found incredible examples of immigrant hope and perseverance that paved the way for a new generation of Asian American chefs, restaurateurs, and culinary entrepreneurs. Join us as we hear their stories on this episode of Lucky Chow. generation has to find its own path, but sometimes they get to build on a trail that's already begun. In this episode, William and I will visit Asian Americans who are building on rich family legacies. First, we head to Pillar Point Harbor in Half Moon Bay, California, to meet a chef who inherited his mother's passion for food. Early Wu Bauer has been nominated for Best Chef Awards three times by the James Beard Foundation. His Chicago-based restaurant, Pacific Standard Time, brings the bounty of the California coast to the Midwest. It's here that his culinary journey began, and it was his mother, Liv Wu, who taught him how to cook the Pacific Standard way. Now, so this is the beginning of cooking for me. I, uh, I was a fisherman first and the cook second. When you pull this animal out of the ocean, and then you get to cut it and cook it, and you get to taste the whole process, that's when I really fell in love with cooking. Really? But yeah, my, gran my grandfather and my mom actually took me fishing a ton. Mom doesn't like to come on boats because she gets sick, but we had a lot of land fishing together. So then, did you start out really cooking fish and seafood? Yeah, for sure. Ooh, I don't think I'm gonna kiss you. <laughs> so when was the last time you went fishing out here? Out here, probably seven years ago. Seven years ago, oh my God. Had a, had a family and a couple of restaurants. In the meantime, it's been a little right. bit long, but these are amazing yellow rock fish. Gorgeous right here, yeah. Hopefully we'll do some more damage. How many fish do you think we're gonna catch today? I don't know. Don't jinx it. That's yeah. like a jinx question. Uh, these are pieces of sole and these are pieces of herring, and we're gonna throw these back down over here and see what happens. Cool, okay. all right. Absolutely an incredible morning. You've caught a couple already. More than a couple, actually, like six. The air smells great. It's a beautiful day. It's like heaven. It's pulling a little bit. I mean, it's definitely, there we go. There we go. Looking good. Look what I caught. Oh. There you go. Hey. Look what we did. After a successful fishing expedition, we joined Erling for a homecoming. Liv Wu is a well-known author and educator who has written cookbooks and founded three cooking schools, including its current incarnation as Live Cook Eat, where she offers classes on cooking locally, seasonally, and improvisationally. A former executive chef for Google, she still lives here in Northern California with the Sun-Kissed Garden and Spectacular Kitchen where Erling fell in love with cooking. Beauty. Some of the rockfish wow. that we got. Wow. That's gorgeous, Erling. Oh! I caught that you one. You caught that. I caught that one. I am impressed. Number um, one. He pulled it over the side, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Chinese word for umami has the character fish in it. Oh. And it has the character lamb. So it, it's the combination oh, of wow. contrasting land and a marine oh, really? that makes umami. Xian, it's, it's pronounced xian. Xian. Yeah. And so anytime you're cooking seafood, you're just bringing up umami. Oh. Anything from the ocean. My mom taught me how to do this. We just run it backwards. And you want to try the other side? Yeah. All right. And then, so because your mom was a food writer, did you grow up with a bunch of chefs and restaurateurs? We did, we did. I was really, really lucky enough to have Rick Bayless in my life early on. Oh. He was a good friend of mom's. Uh -huh. um, and he really taught me to, you know, not be afraid of flavor, that people don't want to eat what they eat at home when they go out. Yeah. Love vinegar, love salt. And how do you describe mom's cooking? 
Uh, mom's cooking is really based in Chinese tradition, okay. trying, trying to celebrate roots. Um, and mine is far more experimental, far more embracing of other cultures. Pull that towards us. Pull hard. Pull. <laughs> oh, I definitely got that in my hair. <laughs> Professionally clean. By Danielle and By Irwin. Danielle, yeah. All right, let's go to it. What I do is I cut, um, with the knife on a 45 degree angle, I cut a couple of slits just, as, just to let flavor penetrate. You want to try that with that, the second sure. fish? All right. Oh, they're slippery. <laughs> it's still alive. Ah! <laughs> is this how you teach your students? It, it is. I say why, so, that, so there's a piece of food science. And then when later on, we're going to talk about the seasoning aspect, which is building flavor. And so if you can build flavor, you don't need a recipe. And if you know the principles of food science, you're, you're, you're really free to cook. I teach all my students to hack recipes. Figure out what's behind a recipe, break it down, make the substitutions, but make intelligent ones and build flavor. Having fished and cooked all morning, we were hungry for lunch and wanted to hear more from Liv about the elements of a perfect meal. And, and what we want to taste is a, a paint set that's global to start with. Do I really have umami? Do I really have a dish that says sweet? Do I have a dish that says sour. Your memory bank of what you've tasted and the stories you hear about food are, are part of you too. Your idea is that American food is fundamentally a hybrid of all these different cultures. There's no definition to the actual cuisine and I actually think that here in Central and Southern California there's actual, the needle is actually moving as far as you know what American food is, right? All of a sudden we had this vessel called the tortilla, and we realized that anything under the sun could go into it, right? And that's American food. That's truly American food. I really think we're living in the immigrant century. Mm -hmm. This is where all the diasporas are uh, meeting each other. We're, we're coming face to face. And, and so, and it, it's adaptive cuisine, and I'm so happy we're past the point of a chef going to some exotic place for two weeks and coming back and putting that on the plate and calling that fusion. It, it's just reality. Thanks for After a delightful day with Liv and Erling, we head south to San Diego to visit another family whose passion also spans generations. In the early 1920s, Junzo Chino migrated to the U.S. from Japan to pursue his dreams of farming. After he and his family were interned in Arizona during World War II, they purchased 56 acres in fertile Rancho Santa Fe, California, and Chino Farms was born. Famed chefs like Alice Waters are drawn to Chino Farms for the high quality, striking beauty, and flavor of their produce. We soon discover what their magic is all about. Well, technically, at one point in time, this farm, like up until like maybe like six years ago, we were in Rancho Santa Fe. Like right after World War II, my family like moved here. They came here, this is the property they had, but like they didn't want to go to high school with them. So they changed like the area codes. So this was in Del Mar. So they had to go like, they had to go to school in like Encinitas instead of like the high school right there because this technically was our rancho. So like all rancho has post offices. We still get our, like, our mail delivered because like for a long time, they didn't want like my family to go to school. Because there. you were Japanese. Correct. And this was after your, grand, your grandmother and grandfather um, came back from the internment camps where they spent... My dad actually has like nine, nine brothers and sisters, or right. eight brothers and sisters, and I think he's the only one who wasn't alive or born in the internment camps. Oh, wow. So I think there's eight of them who experienced yes. some at some level. Obviously, like, depending on what age you were, it's a right. completely different experience, but yeah. And there was two years in the camps before your, your grandparents came here. Correct. We were touched by Makoto's dedication to Chino Farms, which was not in doubt. Yet, we were also curious about the roots of his commitment. With a law degree and opportunities that his grandfather didn't have, why did he choose to spend his life on the farm? We wanted to find out what drew Makoto to the farming life and to Chino Farms in particular. I think the farm defines so much of who I am. Um, in terms of like who I am, I wouldn't want my kids to not have that. But in terms of like the responsibility and stuff like that, like I have breakfast at home, like my parents' home, one day a year my whole life. 
like Christmas Day. That's and it. And it's still by 7.30, he's at the farm, right? Right. So like, that's having breakfast at home. Our seasons are so short. Like, uh, during summer, it's like micro seasons, too. Every two weeks is a new new season of, like, fruit, of greens, or whatever. So it goes goes in and out so quick. It's like lima right. beans, pluots, plums, early plums. Like, it goes so quickly that, like, you can't set a, you know, four, four time a year menu here that doesn't really work. Chino Farms is legendary for producing the highest quality of produce and are known for their heirloom varieties, especially their melons, berries, and corn. William and I head to the fields to harvest the day's bounty. We also get to meet Tom Chino, the patriarch of the farm, and taste his special morning, Taiwanese sorbet swirl watermelon. I didn't know this was a Taiwanese variety. Yeah, oh, Taiwan, the company is very pretty famous for seed. Oh, really? Oh. Season I, was mm. I was born in Taiwan, so. Oh, really? Yeah. That is incredible. Sor yeah. Look at the sorbet soil. Yeah, I love that. For me, it's, it's not just the flavor. I love the texture of this. Oh, I see. Right? Well, ultimately, the, that's the thing about melons. Um, like the seedless watermelons in the United States are mostly a very crisp, hard flesh. Mm. Whereas the Asian melons, the watermelons, have a softer flesh. Yeah. And, they, and so the Japanese have a softer flesh melon. And so they make, they make um, what's a, what we're trying to find is, a, is an Asian variety of seedless melon that has that characteristic soft flesh, but yeah. seedless. William and I lend a hand at the farm stand, where the lines start forming well before the chinos open for business. Ooh. Oh. I don't know. What do you think? Sounds ready to me. Yes. <laughs> this is the 50th anniversary of the farm stand. Oh. And so I think they used to take, they used to do a lot of wholesale peppers. And like they would take it up to LA and sell them in the markets there. But I think right around that time, like mid 60s, is when like grocery stores started having like a direct relationship with the farms instead of the wholesalers. I, I guess my family was like taking stuff up there, but it just wouldn't get sold. And because like, you know, they didn't have the, I guess we're not effusive enough. They were thinking about quitting farming at that time because like they couldn't sell at the wholesale place. They didn't have like direct relationship. Like, I don't think marketing and sales is our strength. I think our strength is we're working hard and making good vegetables. And people find you. Yeah, exactly. As we left Tom, Makoto, and the others, we really did feel like honorary members of the Chino family. We were even included in their annual Oban Festival, where we lit lanterns on the farm to honor the Chino family ancestors. The heartfelt experience was a glimpse of how family bonds can survive and adapt across generations. Not far from the farmlands of Rancho Santa Fe in the heart of Hollywood sits a landmarked institution from the 1930s where its original owner, Lim Kwan, taught generations about the joys of Chinese American cooking. When we heard that the legendary Formosa Cafe just completed a two-year, $2.4 million restoration, we decided to take a road trip up to sunny Los Angeles to learn more about the special place this restaurant occupies in the hearts of both Angelinos and in Asian American entertainment history. This was a cafe in the 1920s called the Red Post. And then in 1939, it became Formosa. Lem Kwan, the chef, became a partner with Jimmy Bernstein and uh, they decided to let Lem choose the theme. He created what we see now. My goal was to preserve all the history that everyone remembers. You know, the place changed several times throughout the decade, little bits. My time was in the 90s, and so the way you see it now is very much the way it was in the 90s, the way you saw it in the movie L.A. Confidential. Right. Just like that. That iconic scene with Lana Turner. Exactly, yeah. yes. Uh, who has a booth here, and then that was, that was a real thing. It wasn't Which one was up. Lana's booth? Lana's was next to Elvis. Ah. Yeah, yeah, and this was Marilyn Monroe's right here. Okay. L.A. had an amazing train system called the Red Car Line. This was from the original series of uh, trains. It was, or by 1930s, it was old and was decommissioned and, and replaced. So you could buy a train car the way you would buy a container today, add it to your business, make a, a cheap, like, add a room. Okay. And uh, that's what they did. They bought this in 1940, added it to the Formosa for more seating. In addition to the beautiful new interiors, the restored Formosa Cafe also acts as a thoughtfully curated exhibition of Asian American Hollywood history and memorabilia. 
And then I also, I tracked down an author that I was a fan of, a guy named Arthur Dong. Okay. He had written a book uh, about the nightclubs of Chinatown, San Francisco, called Forbidden City. And it was right up my alley, exactly the kind of like, 30s, 40s, you know, stuff I like. History, to, yeah. and romance. Exactly. Yeah. And so it turns out he lives in LA, and I met with him, and he was working on a new book called Hollywood Chinese, which is really what the Formosa is. You know, it's a, it's, it's a mix of Hollywood and Chinese together. And so I said, hey, would you like to curate this room? You know, put some of your collection into it. And he, and he, he said yes. He put together, in chronological order, Every Asian American actor, actress from about 1910 all the way to 1970. The menu was mostly Cantonese, Chinese. Chinese American. Yes, exactly. Typical so I, of that time. Yes, I think it was just a mix of whatever Lem knew how to make. Right. You know, ended up on the menu. The restaurant celebration of Asians on both sides of the camera is a collaboration with the writer and filmmaker Arthur Dong, the leading historian of the Asian American role in Hollywood. They walk in, have their drinks, their Mai Tais, have their wontons. If all they feel is that impression like, whoa, I didn't know Hollywood had all these Asian Americans participating and, and they're beautiful and, and they're, they're gruff as well. I mean, there are some of the actors are character actors. Uh, and if that's all that a patient walks away from uh, being in the back room, I would have been happy. I remember the first conversation I had with Bobby was, but you know, I had to think about what my people are gonna think of me doing this work here. Uh, will they think I'm appropriating our culture? Will they think that I'm uh, just using it to, uh, in this environment? And I can see where there might be some criticism, well, how can you do this to our history? But I think the care, and also I think the fact that this is, the Famosa Cafe is so beloved by so many people in town. I was actually completely blown away by the number of Asian Americans lining those walls. All those incredible, gorgeous actors, dancers, directors, producers. I, who knew that Hollywood had such a rich Asian American history? As a kid, I've always loved film history. And my goal is actually be, to be a film historian. But then I became a filmmaker. But everything I do is infused with a lot of research. And, and if you look at my films, they often have really generous doses of archival material. And I think that's because, I mean, I'm not a psychoanalyst, but I think that's why my films have a lot of archival photos uh, and footage. And it's because I just love the research. Making films is an excuse for me to research right. history and especially film history. That's why I think this, this restaurant, this whole concept works so well because it is a historical anthology of what happened during a period of time in LA mm -hmm. and it, so it feels alive and it's breathing. That's why it's a restaurant, it's not a historical museum. You know, exactly. you come here and you eat and you drink and you have fun. But I want you to personally know how personally proud I felt sitting in that room looking up at all those beautiful faces and seeing all that history on the walls made me really proud to be a Chinese American and kind of seeing this part of history that a lot of people don't get to see. So thank you for sharing that with all of us. Thank you. William and I have come to Portland, Oregon, not to find coffee, but in search of America's oldest tofu house. Ota Tofu has been making exquisite tofu in the Pacific Northwest for more than a century, surviving anti-Japanese discrimination and the pressure to automate in a modern world. Ota Tofu sticks to its roots, and we're about to meet the next generation that's carrying on these ancient traditions. Can you tell us a little bit about the history of this place? Yeah, so our operations manager, Ko Ota, his grandfather, uh, Saizo Ota started the company in 1911 and it's been passed on from generation to generation. I've always wanted to buy a business though. I didn't want to buy a business that I was going to work a couple years and then sell it. Right. So I'm here for the long run and um, yeah, I'd hopefully want to pass this down to my kids. What did you do for work before you bought the business? When I was growing up, I always thought that I was gonna play baseball um, and I was gonna be a Major League Baseball player. <laughs> okay. Um, I was fortunate enough to play college baseball where I actually won a national championship with wow. uh, the Oregon State 
University um, in 2007. Go so, Beavers. Yeah, go Beavers. Yeah. So, so your um, dream did come true. Yeah, exactly. Par partly, I mean, in 2008, I actually got drafted by the Texas Rangers organization, wow. and uh, I got to play a couple years of minor league baseball. And awesome. yeah, it was, it was awesome. Um, but unfortunately, I, um, I dove for a ball, I injured my shoulder, and that was it for okay. my baseball career. Yeah. yeah. So, um... Lucky for the tofu industry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Jason takes us into the heart of the Ota factory, where we see for ourselves that tofu making is truly a hands-on business. My vision for this company is to really be a landmark here in Portland. Um, I want people in, Port people in Portland to feel proud that America's uh, oldest tofu company is here, right here in Portland, and that they want to bring their friends or family that visit and come try our tofu. The first step of our process is uh, grinding the beans. So we measure out um, how many beans that we need to uh, do one batch, and then we grind it with water. Our, our manufacturing process is handmade, very hands-on approach. A lot of our other competitors, they have a machine or automated uh, process for making tofu. Um, we actually, Ko and the previous owner, Eileen, tried to automate the process, but it wasn't producing the quality of tofu that they wanted. Next, I go from being a spectator to a participant. I get a lesson in the art of cutting fresh made tofu. The good thing about fresh hand cut tofu is it looks like it was cut by hand, yeah. even if it's a yeah. jittery hand. Well done, Danielle. Awesome. Uh, I'm gonna cut and fry some tofu. This is where my mother will be horrified when she sees these chopstick skills. Oh my, oh my goodness. I knew this was gonna come haunt to haunt me one day. <laughs> Jason, do you eat a lot of tofu? Like how many days a week do you eat tofu? I eat tofu a lot. Um, my favorite is just eating plain tofu with the soy sauce and ginger. How is it? It's incredible. Mm. The texture is not like anything I've ever had mm. before. I've awesome. only had like ready-made silken tofu, but not firm like this. A customer last week traveled from Idaho to the Bay Area, and it was a six-hour detour to come to Portland just for the tofu. Ooh. Wow. Someone just came here. I can see how tofu. this is completely craveable. Yeah. It's uh, detour worthy. <laughs> Absolutely. It's been such an incredible pleasure meeting you, seeing the operation. And Danielle and I, we're pretty fortunate. I mean, I, we want to thank you for keeping this tradition alive. This is a company that has such an incredible legacy, and you are yeah. preserving it. In a small Portland strip mall, we find another family's story, a family business with roots in the dark history of the Vietnam War. I could never imagine that one of America's most beloved Vietnamese restaurants had its roots amidst death and hardship. William Vong worked with the CIA during the war, first as a translator and eventually as an agent. You were an intelligence officer. Yeah, yeah, yeah an intelligence officer, but a trainer to become a combat officer. My unit is supposed to come first for reconnaissance. After the war, I was left behind. At the end of the Vietnam War, William was imprisoned by the communist regime for 10 years. His wife, Christina, had raised their five children without their father. It took an additional six years after he was released to reunite with his family and more long, difficult years to immigrate to Portland. Pining for the flavors of his homeland, William opened the family's first restaurant in 2004. In 2015, William and Christina opened Rose VL. It specializes in hard-to-find regional soups that Christina learned to make from William's mom. They provided nourishment and a connection to William, even during those long years apart. They're known for creating two complex soup offerings each day, soups that have earned Christina a James Beard Best Chef nomination. How do you feel about having your sons continue your legacy through the restaurant business? I'm so lucky. You're so lucky, right? Continue what I'm doing. 
So did, you, did you ever think that you were going to come to Portland and open a restaurant? Never before. Never before, but life takes you places. Everything in your mind creates you something for the family. Uh -huh. When you look at these pictures mm -hmm. and you think about where your life is now, how do you feel? Oh, I feel very lucky and to survive. I don't know how I survived to, until today with 10 years in prison. William and Christina are survivors who rose from the ashes of war and built not only a successful restaurant in America, but a large flourishing family happily enjoying life one spoonful at a time. The future looks bright for William and Christina's family. After all, they, like all our other new friends, are preserving history, honoring tradition, and creating a legacy for future generations through the universal language of food. Each and every one of these stories is rooted in passion, perseverance, and purpose, the three key ingredients to any of life's most fulfilling recipes.